Hi, everyone. Welcome to our presentation for this afternoon. We are going to take you places where you may not have been before, which will be excellent. I'd like to start by welcoming everyone on behalf of the Board of Scans and all of us who are members. Um, we're delighted that you can be here with us, and we have a wonderful and large group of people, some of whom are currently members, and many of you who are just um, joining us as members of the public, but we were, we're hoping that you will come into the fold. I'm going to start with a few housekeeping items. Let me begin by introducing myself. I'm Donnelly Moulton, and I am Chair of the Publicity and Communications uh, Committee. And we help to organize um, these public talks and discussions. If we were face to face, I would give you some instructions for how to get to the washroom, but I'm going to assume we're okay with that. So the only real housekeeping item I have is about asking questions. And because there are so many of us and we are not all um, able to um, access the microphones um, because of technology considerations, we're going to ask if you've got questions, if you would use the chat feature on Zoom, which is down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you've got any questions at any time, please feel free to type in a question. We will be saving all of the questions until after the break. So our format will be that our speaker is going to talk for roughly an hour at which time we will take a 10 minute break and we will come back for some questions and answers. And we're looking forward um, to answering all of your questions. And Stephen tells us that uh, he has nothing booked for the rest of the afternoon. So he's all ours. So feel free to ask away. I'm gonna start with a, a brief introduction, um, but probably a brief in introduction to a place where that many of us doesn't need one. Um, so Pier 21 has been part of the Halifax landscape and part of the Halifax uh, and Nova Scotia history for a very long time. My husband and my sister-in-law, in fact, are going down tomorrow to take in the Canada in Germany exhibit before it closes. For many of us, Pier 21 is remembered for the 1 million immigrants who arrived here and arrived here at that spot. But as you're about to hear, there are many other stories um, about this very important Halifax Pier. That includes secret arrivals of treasure and present day traffic jams. There's a whole range of stories that you're going to, uh, to hear from our speaker, whose name is Stephen Schwinghammer, and he's a historian at the Canadian Museum of Immigration, affiliated with the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling at Concordia University. Stephen is also the co-author of a book with Jan Raska called Pier 21, A History. And Stephen tells us he is particularly interested in the policies and places of Canadian immigration, especially in the 20th century. I'm going to hand this now over to Stephen and to let us get underway and welcome everyone. Well, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. Uh, yeah, my name is Steve Schwinghammer. I'm a historian here at the museum. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, introduce you to the history of this site. Uh, what we're going to do this afternoon is walk around the gallery that's devoted to the history of this space, Pier 21, as a national historic site, as a historic immigration facility. And we're going to talk about some of those histories. But the first thing we need to do, I, I think, is put Pier 21 in a little bit of context. Um, and so behind me, there's a, a large map of of the Atlantic. And that's the first kind of the biggest context for Pier 21. It was part of this, and I will say British, part of this British Atlantic world. Um, it functioned as a, a critical ocean port, but, but very much, you know, serving the North Atlantic. And that places certain limits on what immigration happened here and so on. But it also goes to the spirit and the mentality behind the building and the maintenance of the site. And we'll come to this in different ways as we talk about 
how it was built and its relationship with the community and, and so on. But the next context that I wanna talk about is a little different and let's walk around a little bit and take a look at closer context. So, all right, so we've got the Atlantic world and then we've got Nova Scotia. All right, well, Pier 21, you know, we know it to be in Halifax, but of course, this is Mi'kmaq, right? Um, Mi'kmaq, the, the land of the Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq are the first people of what we now term Nova Scotia, but also, you know, the territory traditionally encompassed uh, PEI, uh, certain parts of New Brunswick, uh, the Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec, uh, communities in Newfoundland and Maine, and uh, Mi'kmaq have shared this unceded homeland with immigrant communities for four centuries and, and ongoing. And when we think of Pier 21 existing in this space, the other piece that's important here to remember is that that means, you know, that the site, the people in it, and, and all of us resident here, we're part of this historical and legal relationship between Canada and First Nations. You know, here we think of it in terms of the treaties of peace and friendship. So in finer context, you know, we say we're in Mi'kmaq, well, that place was known as, Halifax was known as Chibuktuk, the Great Harbor, right? And I, I think it's a, a just a superb name for this site. The Great Harbor, naturally ice-free, deep, right? Close to efficient routes to and from Europe, right? But what that means is when we think about Pier 21, Pier 21 opened in 1928. Uh, Halifax has been a, an important port for a lot longer than that. And even in the scope of Canadian immigration for much longer. Before Pier 21, we had immigration facilities at Pier 2 for almost 50 years. Now, for those of you who may know the city a little better, if we think about um, a little north in the harbor from here, near where the closer the bridges is, the McKay, there's the casino, there's the Navy base and so on. Pier 2 is in that area, a little deeper in the harbor. Pier 2 was uh, part of what was called the deep water terminus. And it was a complex, you know, the railroad uh, served a, a set of piers meant to bring in cargo and to bring in as well passengers. Um, after the rail link from Halifax inland was completed in the late 1870s, this got busy. But the facilities for greeting passengers were not very good, <laughs> not good at all. Um, and so there began to be sort of a, a little bit of pressure. You know, we're beginning to see more traffic, more people are coming on that North Atlantic route uh, where Halifax is right on side for people to take an efficient crossing from one of those ports. Liverpool, for example, was a common port of departure. Come to Halifax and they're greeted at basically, you know, a cargo shed on our waterfront with open doors, even in the winter. So immigration officials said, look, you know, we, we need to do a little better than this. There's a lot of people coming in. Uh, one of them wrote a very poignant letter about um, severe illness having been caused to delicate children from the wintry conditions on the Halifax waterfront, which I don't know if today is a great example of, but you can certainly believe come February, I think. Um, and so by 1890, they were beginning to build more robust facilities. They built a, a dedicated shed. There was a little cottage. They started thinking about really having uh, a processing center for immigration in our city. And for me, this is important because when we think about immigration to Halifax, it's important not to limit ourselves to Pier 21 as much as, you know, me standing here, uh, you know, it's, it's my favorite site to explore in terms of the history and so on. It's not the only story for, for Halifax. And in fact, more people came in at Pier 2 than did at Pier 21. Pier 2 operated from the 1890s right up through until 1928. Well, that means it was open during the busiest years for Canadian immigration until very recently. But those boom years of settlement into the Canadian West and so on, people arriving into Halifax, they were coming into Pier 2. Now, unlike Pier 21, 
Pier 2 changed a lot when it was running. It started as a small shed in a little cottage. It was not very good. Every time the trains went by, the whole building would shake. The immigration officers were very upset. There, it was open underneath, so people from the general public would be down under the immigration shed, you know, uh, on Sundays, apparently drinking and smoking, which provoked the objections of the immigration officials for moral as well as security reasons. Um, and over time, they had to improve it. So they added, you know, a, a second story to the building to try to improve accommodation for passengers coming in that way. Um, but at Pier 2, one of the main limitations was actually how big the pier itself sticking out into the harbor was. And of course, if we think about those years, the late 1800s and the early 1900s, boy, that's a period of amazing technical change with steamships and they're getting a lot bigger. <laughs> and a pier that you build thinking, you know, of maybe a very small steamship or even a sailing ship, it's not gonna accommodate some of these giant liners that are coming around in the early 1900s. And so towards the end of the use of Pier 2, we get a much different facility, which is pictured nicely on the wall here. And I'm gonna bring us around to have a little look. So this is the last building that was at Pier 2. And it's a big shed and you can see a, a, an A-liner from the uh, from Canard, the Andania alongside there, nicely accommodated with another ship on the other side of the pier. Both of those are modern, up-to-date, common callers as passenger liners. And this new pier, it was built almost 700 feet long. It's more than big enough to take these ships. Immigration is on the second floor, so passengers can step right from the ships across a gangway conveniently into the immigration space and then go down the floor to meet the train. And that was safer and more secure. The earlier piers, passengers, they could debark right onto the level of the, the, what was called the brow of the pier, the same level as the trains. And this was actually kind of dangerous. You know, hundreds of, of passengers debarking right where there's working trains. It was um, occasionally a recipe for accidents, but also I mentioned security you could control where people were moving a lot more easily if you only had a limited number of stairwells. <laughs> so this pier had a couple of design elements that we actually see echo when we come along to Pier 21. And this more modern building, it was opened in 1915. 1915, of course, is during the First World War. And Pier 2 very quickly gets put to work as one of the key embarkation sites for Canada during the First World War. It was built to accommodate, you know, big ships coming in and people getting off and joining the trains, but the process worked just as well in reverse. And I'm, I'm showing you here a painting by Arthur Lismer of, uh, well, this is as it was at the time, HMT Olympic, um, His Majesty's Transport, the Olympic, uh, at Pier 2, and I love that Lismer has done this and that he was very active at Pier 2 capturing this history of this earlier Halifax immigration site because Lismer came to Canada as an immigrant by way of Pier 2. Uh, and so to find him there as one of Canada's, you know, he's celebrated obviously as an artist in the Group of Seven, but to find him there as one of Canada's war artists at the site that he first came to the country I think has a, uh, a wonderful kind of circularity to it, but also it suggests um, a meaning for the artist and an intimacy with the site that I really like. So this painting is quite well known, but uh, if you are curious about Lismer's work, um, a number of his beautiful sketches from when he was working uh, as a war artist at Pier 2 are available through the National Gallery and uh, actually through our colleagues at the War Museum as well, uh, online, you can look for some beautiful pencil sketches of the interior of the space being used to you know, see Canada's war effort out during the, the conflict. But 1915 interests me for another reason, and it's this. 1915 is when construction started at this pier. And it's kind of funny to think of, 
you know, they, they've got this um, astonishing facility just created up there. I, I said like a, a wonderfully long pier and, and uh, up to date and, um, you know, able to accommodate the demands of modern passenger traffic. But at the same time, they're building the ocean terminals here in the south end. And this is kind of significant. Uh, you know, the railway that was building both, it's the same landlord for immigration. Immigration didn't own the buildings. They were operated by the railway. And so this plan to improve the city was visible all over the place, right? This was a huge construction project. And the reason I am putting some gloves on is I've got some artifact images here that I'd like to share physically uh, with you uh, related to the construction that reflect just how big a project it was and kind of how cool it was too. Uh, one of the, this is a national historic site. It's got that designation. But one of the things that people don't know about this site maybe so much is that the uh, Canadian Society for Civil Engineers has actually designated this ocean terminals area all around Pier 21, the, the seaport market area as it was, what's going to be, I gather, NASCAD in the future, all this flat space around here. It's a national historic site for the engineering that went into it. Let's have a little look and, and see why I think it's cool and why they designated it. So, I guess first, get a sense of scope. This is a picture of what was called the bulkhead passenger landing key. And we can see in the picture, the flat ground that if you've been here, you might associate with experiencing the site. The reason it's so flat, and it sticks almost a quarter mile out into the harbor, is that it's filled. Everything down here is built on an artificial foundation, right? And so when I talk about this site beginning to get underway in 1915, I'm not talking about building a building. I'm talking about dredges and barges and work going way out beyond the natural shoreline of the harbor to fill an enormous space and make a new center for transportation in this area of the city. It's kind of neat. Uh, it involved a huge amount of fill and it involved a huge amount of change around the city. And that made a lot of people kind of annoyed. It's, uh, actually, of all things, uh, the sisters who run Mount Saint, ran Mount St. Vincent, uh, they were one of the most litigious of the, uh, the uh, complainers uh, they ran a lawsuit against the federal government for almost a dozen years over the damage to their property down in the Bedford Basin area related to the changes necessary to make Pier 21 work way up here in the South End. The city was transformed, right? There was addition to the railways down there, widening the railway, seizing land out around the Bedford Basin. Then there was a tremendous rail cut right, all around the peninsula, right? that affected the West End, it affected some of the most wealthy and um, energetic residents in the city when it cut through the South End, uh, close to Point Pleasant. And then of course, this massive area that was filled. So the objections, the criticism, the contrary voices, uh, there, was, there was a lot of blowback about the idea of this project, but it was couched very much in the idea of Nova Scotia, and particularly you know, through Halifax, becoming a port that could participate in what we think of as you know, the national policy, consolidating the movement of, of goods and trade from Canadian sources through Canadian ports. It was a commercial project, right? And so you know, the tacking on of the handling of the passenger trade and so on, this was kind of a secondary thought. So let's just see if I can show you a couple of the other images here. Now, I really like this one in the foreground. That, what is that? <laughs> and I love this shot because it, it requires a little explanation. We see there a barge and kind of a, it looks like a vertical tunnel going down into the water. That 
that's exactly what it is. It's a hatchway and a tunnel, and it's leading down into a huge diving bell, pressurized, where uh, construction workers would work on the harbor floor, uh, putting in the footings necessary for the pier. So when we talk about sort of the scope of the construction and the interesting engineering, that's certainly an aspect of it. Here's another one, I love this. Uh, this excavator, uh, fittingly for the time, that's the Lord Kitchener, what else would it be? Um, set by the contractor to be one of the largest excavators in the world at that time, uh, working away on the project of clearing and getting ready to fill the, uh, the footings necessary for this project. And then up here, to give a sense of, if you will, the cultural moment that this was, we see here a ceremony of opening and you can see a big concrete form in the foreground. Now this is in October of 1915 and we have Prime Minister Borden and the Governor General and this big form would be moved over and boop, dropped into the harbor and then filled. And what that was, was the stabilizing um, sort of part of the foundation of the pier to put it in place. But as a cultural moment, I mean, you think about it, you've got the prime minister, you've got the governor general, there's a, it's a high profile event. So, In 1915, just as that new Pier 2 was opening, you have as well this remarkable, uh, extremely expensive, controversial development happening here at the ocean terminals to bring this new site into being. A site that was mainly commercial, but absolutely it included forecasting that they would have the passenger trade and immigration here in years to come. Now, it took a long time for this to get here. I'm saying 1915, and some of you are doubtless saying, uh, he said it opened in 1928. Yes, I said it opened in 1928. 13 years later, a baker's dozen. Um, why did it take so long? Well, partly the answer is wartime. Uh, partly the answer has to do with Halifax in the war. Uh, many of us will recall immediately what happened in the Halifax Harbor during the war, the Halifax explosion, which caused enormous damage to the other transportation infrastructure in the harbor, just as this new facility with new rail links and new piers and the key was put in place. And so later in the construction of this site, what is happening? The contractor is constantly being interrupted because there's shipping traffic that has nowhere else to go in Halifax's damaged harbor. Um, the contractor, they're also, <laughs> their cranes are going from working on those big forms that we looked at to helping move guns on and off vessels that are sailing either as armed merchant cruisers or um, like Q ships, they were called. Um, for war service. And the contractor said, yes, we'll do that. Just, you know, don't be mad at us because it's gonna delay the work and delay it, it did, right? All of the war activity pushed the schedule for getting even the, just the ground here, that flat piece of earth necessary to put Pier 21 in place. That took two years longer than they expected. And then you're into the period after the war. Now, after the war is a period of some uh, to use the word that's going around, austerity. <laughs> uh, spending is greatly constrained, right? And um, in addition, building materials and labor are kind of in straits. It's hard to find. Mm -hmm. So in 1919, this site gets built with the steel that's available. Now, Pier 21, and we'll have a look at it via a model in just a second, but it was imagined initially that this ocean terminal complex it would have sort of a gracious union station, you know, the big arched windows. And there was even an idea of like a tower down here and so on, it was very fancy. Um, but by 1919, what's available to build with? Not much. They wind up having to use spare steel from one of the other planned cargo sheds just to get something in place here. And so instead of this gorgeous union station that was envisioned, 
you wind up with a pitched roof cargo shed, <laughs> you know, which is pretty much as, as uh, humble an accommodation as you might get. Now, the steel got put in place in 1919, but nothing else. And for another six years, there was a skeleton on the Halifax waterfront. And you can actually find pictures of the bare skeleton. There's even one or two videos uh, from the water side of just this stick work, like, you know, tinker toy or something sticking up out of the ground, just the steel work, empty frames, no, no, not cladded in, no floors, no walls, not even staircases. But in 1925, two things are going on, six years later, right? Two things. One is the maritime rights movement, right? This uh, regional protest that the profits and the, the benefits of Confederation are passing the maritime region by. And the other thing is a, a local federal by-election. And uh, in 1925, we were certainly not in any way out of the era of pork barrel politics. <laughs> so um, as this by-election comes up, the federal government announces that they're gonna spend money on completing parts of this terminal complex, right? Um, also in 1925, the federal government signs a, an agreement with these major railways. And remember, the railways are the transportation, the, uh, pardon me, the transportation agency that's actually building this stuff, right? The railways, the federal government and the railways sign agreements. So the railways can go over to Europe, they can recruit, they can vet, they can uh, make sure like through medicals and interviews that immigrants are fit to come to Canada. They can transport them to Canada on their own ships because in those days, Canadian Pacific and Canadian National ran ships. They can bring them inland on their own trains and settle them on their own pieces of land. I mean, the railways were making money <laughs> every step of this, right? It was, it was just raining, raining coin for them. These were called the railway agreements. And it was a, certainly an incentive for what became the Canadian National Railway during this construction project to get down to business, right? In terms of making good its immigration facility on the North Atlantic. And its immigration facility was here in Halifax, the ocean terminals and specifically Pier 21. So what did they build at Pier 21? Well, let's have a look. So this is a model of the site and it shows us a little bit of it. It's basically a long shed, 500 feet long as it was built, right? And like Pier 2 before it, we see on the second floor, the immigration facilities. And a little different from Pier 2, we see an annex building. So the building on the water side, Pier 21, sort of the the, maybe the better known of the buildings, that was for people. That was the immigration side. People did their medical and they did their civil exam where they spoke to the immigration officer. And then they came over the walkway into the annex building, which was for customs, for dealing with stuff. And here you would have social services and ticketing agencies. People would work with their large baggage and then they would wait for the train to go inland. All right. So this site, it's quite big, two 50,000 square foot chunks. Um, it opens in March of 1928. And despite a fire uh, in 1944 during the war, the means of operating within it don't change too much. So what we're gonna do now is we're actually gonna walk around the historic space a little bit and get a little more of an introduction to what the space was and how it was used. So I'm gonna walk us out here to the airing gallery the, where the gangway was, where people actually stepped off the ship and took their first steps into Canada. So let's just have a little look as we come around. It's um. <laughs> 
I don't know if you'll be overwhelmed by the view today because of the weather, I apologize, I couldn't make better arrangements. Um, but uh, this is where people first came in. Many remember George's Island as part of their view of the harbor. And when people came in, there are these two sets of doors in this space. One that I just came through just here and the other a little further down is where people who are actually bound in for Canadian immigration would go. Now, this space, I, I must admit, uh, I have a, a little attachment to it myself because my grandmother, my aunt, came in to the country through this space, like many others. And so part of what we do here is we invite people to share their own stories about coming in, what Pier 21 means to me, and then they leave us a little testimony about the site. For me, um, in terms of the immigration history, you know, my grandmother was a war bride. Uh, she married a Canadian soldier, my grandfather, and she brought my aunt in right at this site where the gangway was. When she or any other immigrant came in, the first place they would go was a large assembly area. Now, when Pier 21 opened, that assembly area could accommodate um, almost a thousand people, two big open spaces. Let's have a little look. So like this, right? This is a, actually a, a picture from 1928 of people in the assembly area waiting for immigration processing. And we have a, a little bit of a, a space to recall the assembly area here. That assembly area, uh, it was um, even after the war when it was made a little smaller, it was a large open area where hundreds of people would wait and they would wait for two things. They would wait for first their medical examination and second, the civil examination. Now the medical exam, uh, When we think of the kinds of inspections and the kinds of questions that were asked here, uh, it's important to put in context. By the 1920s, immigration to this site uh, was governed by very rigorous overseas screening. So somebody who is coming here, you know, they'd be, having left a country generally in Europe, they would have already spoken to an approved Canadian roster doc, even before they joined their ship, right? They would have gone, they'd have an X-ray, and I think we have a nice sample of an X-ray over here. Um, you know, they'd have a, a slide showing they weren't tubercular, right? And they'd have, all the required vaccinations, they do a physical before they got on the ship. And so when they get here, the medical that generally they get is just a few minutes, right? And it's only meant to ensure really that um, there's no new illness, no conditions that were missed, and there's no injuries, uh, nothing that would make it unsafe for them to proceed inland. So, this sets us up for understanding Pier 21 as part of a bigger border. When we think about the Canadian border, it's awfully tempting to think of it as sort of, you know, like a, a line, right? Like a geographic line where Canadian waters start or where the physical boundary is, like the, the land boundary with the United States. But as it happens, that's not terribly helpful. Um, the reason is, of course, for many immigrants, their encounter with the Canadian border starts months before they're on Canadian soil and thousands of kilometers away. Often they'd be, you know, in maybe uh, Rome or uh, maybe they go to Vienna, something like that. I'm just gonna set this up so we get a good view of the assembly area as it was. There we go. Um, 
So when they do that medical and then they come for their civil examination to talk to the immigration officers, they're not walking up and saying, hey, my name is Bob, I'd like to come to Canada, right? No, not even in the 1920s. Uh, by then, you know, these systems are worked out. They're coming up and they're laying down papers showing they've already done an interview, right? To say what their job is gonna be, if they have relatives in the country, uh, how much money they expect to bring with them, their literacy levels, all these kinds of things have been screened. So they've been screened for health, they've been screened for um, eligibility under the Immigration Act. And after the Second World War, they're also screened for stage B, which is security screening by the RCMP. I love that they didn't just say security screening, they, they could only call it stage B because you know you couldn't possibly let someone know that you were looking for communists during the Cold War. I don't like, did anyone think it was a secret? I, I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> although that process does give rise to my favorite piece of immigration paperwork uh, that I've come across when working here. Um, you required a reference for security purposes at certain points in time. And one that came up here was for a, a young Italian guy coming from a smaller village in Italy. And the same guy was the mayor and the chief of police in this small town. And the security reference was, Giuseppe's a good boy, he's always in church. <laughs> that was it, that was the security reference. Um, but uh, it emphasizes too, that when somebody gets here, they're well prepared, right? They've had that x-ray, right? They've had their shots. They know what to expect. So they lay down the papers and these interviews, medical or civil exam, you're talking two or three minutes, right? And, and they're done. Right? It's not long. This is significant for a few reasons in, in the present as well as in the past. Um, one of the things this does is it keeps the, the rate of refusal that we see for Pier 21 very, very low, right? So if we talk about the rate of refusal of immigrants from this site, we can look and we can say, oh, you know, over time, the average is less than 1% refusal. And there are stories we tell ourselves as Canadians about immigration to this country, right? Uh, that Canada, particularly after the 1970s, Canada is multicultural, it's open, we're tolerant of diversity in the migration to the country and so on. Less than a 1% refusal rate at this significant ocean arrival port suggests that this is true. But the only reason that's true is because we did all our refusing over there, right? So somebody goes into an office in Vienna and says, I'd like to come to Canada. Um, you know, depending on the time period, they turn over his hands, look for calluses and say, you're not a farmer, hit the road or whatever reason of refusal arises, right? So when we think about how our system was structured, it's important for us to remember how much of our border operates out of our site halfway around the world, but it's still touching people's lives. People who might be reasonable candidates to come here, but they fall afoul of some regulation or whatever, and their journey to Canada stops before it even begins, right? Now, because of all this screening, most people came through Pier 21 and they never even encountered what we call the, the accommodation, the immigration quarters, accommodation or detention. But it was a significant part of the site. And we're just gonna have a quick look here. Um, accommodation and detention, uh, there was a large part of the facility set aside for people who needed to stay if something went awry. And this certainly did happen. Um, a good example, uh, again, going back to farmers coming to the country because agriculture was such a priority. Um, somebody could plan to come the year before and a farmer could be having a good season and say, yeah, I can, you know, I, I can take a, uh, a farm laborer next season, but the season doesn't finish well, something goes wrong. And that farmer has to send word to immigration that he can no longer fulfill the contract. Meanwhile, you know, a laborer is on his way. He gets to Pier 21, steps off the ship and finds out the contract isn't what he thought it would be. 
generally deportation is not the answer, but they can't let him go inland yet because he doesn't have settlement arrangements. So he'd have to stay. And so there were accommodations. There was, you know, the kitchen. There was actually a recreation room with a stage. Um, there were airing galleries. And we see here the airing galleries where people could look out over the harbor, but they were barred. And people by times were, were quite aware of those bars, right? As an interruption in the journey they had hoped to take. So, you know, the experience of that could be quite mixed. Some people would remember, oh, you know, I was uh, coming into the country, something went wrong and they put me up for a few days, fed me some meals, got me on a train as soon as the contract came together. Another person will experience that as coming to Canada and being held in a cell, right? Same process, but in some cases, bitterly disappointing. Right? Now, if they, and as I say, most people, because of the screening, they weren't implicated in that detention, either in accommodation or in the strong rooms. Um, the next step for, for most people would be customs. They've cleared through stuff for themselves. Now they go over that walkway into that other building we saw in the model, the annex building. And that's where they clear their stuff. So the first thing they do is they go through a walkway and sometimes there are things to be confiscated. Um, certain kinds of foods, even some books, certain kinds of alcohol, all could be forbidden depending on the regulations and they could be removed. But often there were language barriers about doing this. So it could be very difficult and people could uh, feel a little bit sensitive about having personal belongings uh, removed if they didn't understand the reasons. The other fact of people bringing stuff to the site is that there was a very wide range of how much people could bring. So some people came as displaced persons with you know, one bag and almost nothing in it. Other people, uh, particularly coming in a little later after the war into the mid fifties and so on, they would bring crates. Many European countries had limits on how much people were allowed to bring. And one of the, uh, in terms of money, excuse me, um, you know, they would not allow people to bring out a lot of money right away. But what you could do instead is bring stuff. And so what we have here is a, a sample of a, a kist, a, a crate for a family from the Netherlands. <laughs> it even does include a kitchen sink, yes. And that's actually based on a, a family story of having brought one. Um, but the idea is one of the ways to get around a limitation on how much you could bring in funds was to bring more possessions. And my favorite story, uh, a very, in my mind, a very clever story uh, about getting around these constraints was uh, the story of a family leaving from the Netherlands uh, and they were unable to bring very much money at all. But what they did was they bought a combine harvester, crated it up and brought it to Canada. And then they rented it to their neighbors. And so by, having the machinery and renting it, they recovered the value of their wealth, even though they weren't able to bring, you know, currency. Uh, I mean, it's pretty inventive. I, I think it probably was against the spirit of the rules, but they did it and it worked. Uh, and the family was able to create prosperity, well, sustain their prosperity in immigration because of it. Immigration often artificially creates poverty for people because of these kinds of rules. Uh, and um, I love that story of a clever dodge. Anyway, so once people get through stuff, because that has to be checked too for contraband and uh, people did try to smuggle different kinds of items through often um, secreting money or jewelry, uh, but also simpler things, you know, uh, foods that were made by their family that they wanted to have for the, the train journey inland and so on. So there's lots of stories of things like that. People uh, holding back a little bit on their customs declaration, if you will. Um, but once they get through customs and they have their large bags checked, then the next step is of course, to join the train. And heading inland on the train, uh, 
for many people, this was, this was where the experience really hit home. You know, now this, this train car is a little too wide and a little too clean, I think, for the historical experience, but I do love it anyway, because if nothing else, the seats are every bit as uncomfortable as they should be, uh, which is certainly one of the pieces of, of memory for immigrants uh, leaving on the train and heading inland from Pier 21. Now, for a lot of people coming here between 1928 and 1971, uh, about a million immigrants arrived here, many of them from Europe. Um, the, uh, the train journey is where things kind of hit home. You know, um, the ship, it was almost surreal. You know, it was so different from uh, their, their lived experiences. You know, they didn't have something maybe to anchor it against, but when they got on a train, well, that was comparable. Lots of people have been on train rides, but maybe not like this. Days and days and days on a very slow train headed across a country that, you know, for somebody coming from say the Netherlands or even from England, the train journey in Canada was almost incomprehensibly big, <laughs> you know? Um, there is a story from, uh, uh, again, a young Italian guy heading inland in the 50s. After three days on the train, uh, they actually had to stop the train and find someone who could translate enough to reassure him because he was so upset. He figured he couldn't possibly be in the same country anymore. Um, and he was distraught. You know, he, he didn't know where he was going and, and he was having profound language difficulty. And they had to reassure him that, no, it's, the train is slow and the country's that big. <laughs> you know, um, another story I love um, is a gentleman, uh, he had served with the Dutch military uh, after the end of the Second World War in uh, Indonesia during that country's fight to decolonize and become independent. And he came back to the Netherlands and he, he married a sweetheart uh, and they headed out to Canada as their honeymoon uh, in the winter, which I, I have thoughts about that as a honeymoon, but anyway, uh, they come across the Atlantic, they get on the train uh, and to this day, you know, they tell the story about sort of going across New Brunswick and through the Gaspé and down along the St. Lawrence in the snow and the cold. And they were telling me the story and they, they grabbed each other's hands and they started crying. And the gentleman, you know, he, uh, he's, a, he's a character, he's a good storyteller. He, uh, he looked at me, he said, my God, what had I done to my wife to bring her to this country? Um, and it, you know, it, it, was, it was a funny moment in a way, but for them, this is where it hit. You know, they're looking out the windows of the train and the difference in the geography, the unfamiliarity of the land really came home. So this, for many people, that's, that's sort of where the connection to Pier 21 um, cuts out, if you will, and we start getting into stories of settlement and, and uh, being in a new place. But there is one more really significant aspect to the history here that I, I do want to cover before we move to questions. And that's the history of the site during the Second World War. Now I mentioned for Pier 2, you know, these sites, they're built for a, a big ship to come in and people to get off and get onto the train and it worked just as well in reverse. Well, that's, that's true for Pier 21 as well. You know, uh, you have this very good transportation site situated in this North Atlantic world. And when the Second World War breaks out, right, it, it, it's obvious that the same infrastructure can serve a train coming in, disembarking uh, soldiers from the train, marching them onto the ship and heading them across that Atlantic, uh, the North Atlantic to take up uh, service in the European theater. Now that's, that's the big story of Pier 21 during the war, right? The big story of Pier 21 during the war is that embarkation and return story where more than 400,000 Canadian military personnel have their, their path through here to go for service, right? But 
there's lots of other things too. And probably the, the best example of this to sort of bring home the variety of, of presence here during wartime uh, is a convoy that arrived in July of 1940. So we're, we're, we're talking early days of July, I think it's the 7th of July, 1940. Um, a convoy arrives in the harbor and it's escorted by the HMS Revenge, a, a significant battleship at the time, you know. Was, um, and you have a, a number of passenger ships and they, they come into Pier 21. Uh, and what comes off these ships? Well, You've got children being evacuated from the United Kingdom. Many of you may be familiar with the story of the, uh, the guest children, the evacuee children who were sent for safety during the Second World War from the United Kingdom to Canada. You know, some thousands of them did come. Uh, there were also many more who came privately, either as individual uh, little kids or, or sometimes evacuated families being hosted to Canada. So you have this evacuation of civilians and people moving through here in some numbers during the war. Um, but you also had a, a little group of free Polish diplomats, right? Coming on the quiet from Europe to help facilitate the operations of a free and independent Polish government while their territory is occupied. And they bring to Canada uh, like classified wireless gear to, to talk with um, their, their main representation, which is in the UK. But also arriving in this convoy are Polish cultural treasures, which had been evacuated from Wawel Castle at the outbreak of war, right? And literally under the guns of the two invading forces coming into Poland at the time, the Russians and the Germans sort of doing that uh, closing of the jaws on Polish territory in late 1939, this, these two curators right, with a selection of, of manuscripts. They have Chopin's original handwritten notations for his music. They have uh, uh, tapestries. They have the coronation sword used uh, to, to um, preside over the, the incoming, the, the coronation of Polish kings since you know, the, the 1500s. They have another sword presented by the Pope to the Polish king after the defense of Vienna in the 1600s. They, just these incredible cultural treasures, but treasures that anchor the sense of Poland as an independent, free, fierce country, right? Um, they're, they're brought out, they go south through Europe, fleeing the war, they go through the Mediterranean, they're in France for a little bit, but of course, France gets invaded in 1940. So the curators escape again to the UK and then from the United Kingdom, they finally find their way with this convoy full of amazing things across the Atlantic to arrive here at Pier 21 and then to go inland for safekeeping. Also in this convoy, hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars in gold and securities, treasure, literal treasure, being sent for safety, again from Europe, to secure the finances of countries at war in case of invasion or you know, damage to where they're being held in Europe. So when we think about the wartime role of the pier, yeah, you've got this mobilization of troops that a lot of us know and a lot of us identify with the wartime history of the site. But there's a lot of other things going on too. You have these civilians arriving, you have these incredible cargoes coming through. This convoy also brings, though, prisoners of war. Friendly military personnel came through here lots, right? Canadians going out, allies coming in in huge numbers to do air training in Canada, one of Canada's most important contributions in the war, right? Air training in Canada, 60,000 allied airmen came by sea to train here and then go and serve, right? But we also had enemy personnel, right? And so you get uh, German prisoners of war arriving. There's a, a story from the, the pier here uh, from the time of arrival of one of the first groups of prisoners of war accepted in Canada. Um, Canada agreed to in turn uh, a certain number of people from the UK deemed to be dangerous prisoners, right? But when they get here and they're getting off the ship, 
right from the outset, something looks amiss. <laughs> and so one of the Canadian military personnel there, he's a lieutenant, he's Jewish. He looks at the crowd and he's sort of giving the usual military prisoner instructions, you know, turn out your pockets. There'll be a receipt given for anything we take from you. You'll be given instructions, which car of the train to join and so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah. Um, but at the end of it, he throws in in Yiddish, keep a little change in your pockets, I won't look, right? Or words to that effect. And about half the people he's looking at kind of look at him again. And he's like, why do these people who are supposed to be dangerous Nazi prisoners understand Yiddish? <laughs> this does not add up. Um, you know, and what quickly becomes apparent is what happened is in this movement of prisoners of war, the UK bundled in dangerous enemy aliens, dangerous enemy aliens being a refugee from Germany who fled to the UK, right, a German national, probably Jewish, often they were, fleeing from Nazi persecution, arriving for safety in the UK, but then because they're German nationals, they're determined to be enemy, and then they get busted for what? having a radio or something like this, right? Um, and so they're deemed a threat. And so they're sent to Canada for internment. So of this first group, you know, several thousand of them were actually civilian internees. What rapidly had to happen is the camps in Canada for internment had to differentiate. There's actually one of the camps in Quebec that became a degree granting campus of McGill University because of the number of professors that were mixed up in this movement. Um, you know, just, it's incredible. Uh, and at the end of the war, um, the, the people who were brought in this way, uh, <laughs> how would you describe it? Uh, they were certainly refugees, but, but uh, forced <laughs> by, by way of this internment movement to come to Canada. They were invited to stay. And in fact, almost a thousand accepted the invitation to become Canadian citizens. And, you know, the overwhelming majority extraordinarily highly educated. It was, a, it was a, a massive movement of cultural and intellectual capital to the country that came out of, you know, uh, believing we were taking just, you know, conscript soldiers who couldn't be safely kept interned in the UK. So when we talk about the variety of wartime roles at the pier, you know, this is part of it. A lot of this was not visible to the, the city of Halifax up close during the war because the site was secure. But the traffic, of course, people could see the ships coming and going and make pretty good guesses about what was going on in the harbor. Um, and in fact, through our colleagues at the Nova Scotia archives, there's the journal of the wartime censor. The guy is supposed to control how much everybody knew about this. He's writing a journal of everything you could want to know <laughs> about these happenings, which I'm sure was against the rules. Uh, Jefferson is, is his name and his papers and his photographs, God bless him, he took all the photographs he was telling other people not to take too. Um, they're on the Nova Scotia Archives website and they're fabulous. But they, they really present in more detail and with a real personal character, um, some of this remarkably diverse activity uh, from wartime in the city. So I think what I'll do is conclude that little bit of wartime history uh, by pointing out that the security went away after the war and almost immediately um, the activity at the waterfront here at the pier became sort of part of the cultural fabric of the city. Um, I have a, a, I had the opportunity to speak to a guy who was a, a schoolboy in 1946-47 uh, and he told stories about you know watching the harbor with his friends and when the big troop ships would come, they would uh, play hooky, they'd come down to the pier side uh, and the soldiers would throw them money, uh, foreign coins, right? And they could make 20 bucks, you know, uh, pick up uh, this money. And then they'd go up to the Royal Bank uptown and, and get it changed. And $20 in those days would keep you in hamburgers and movies for, for a week instead of not quite buying one anymore, I suppose. Um, but he told this story as, uh, and for me, it was emblematic, you know. Um, after the war, people were much more free to come down and be with military band that was playing, to see the ships come in, and in some cases, to see their relatives or people they knew come in to return from service. So um, this sort of fed directly into 
the reopening of the site and the first big wave of immigration after the war, which was directly linked to the war. And that was the one I mentioned in connection to myself, the war brides. Um, you know, there's almost 65,000 war brides and, and children that came to Canada, almost all through this site as sort of that biggest boom of post-war immigration. But that was just the leading edge of the wave, right? Uh, as we transitioned away from that wartime activity to the boom years of operating as the immigration site for which we now mainly celebrate the history here, right? The vast majority of those almost a million immigrants who came into Pier 21 arrived in those years right after um, the Second World War, sort of 1946, right through the mid 50s. And you have people coming either directly or indirectly as a result of the war here to Halifax. Now, I'm gonna conclude my presentation there. I've, uh, we've walked through sort of how the site worked. We've done a quick outline of the military history. Um, what I'm gonna do is invite Bill to uh, set us up for a little break. Uh, and then we'll be set for questions in about 10 minutes time. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you for that, Stephen. That was incredible. I am always amazed by what we don't know about our own community. And we do have a number of questions for you. So let me dive in. Our first question says, my four grandparents immigrated separately from various places in Europe, arriving at various times to Pier 2 in the early 1900s. Are there records available at Pier 21 or elsewhere in Halifax that I can search for their arrivals? Yeah, um, if, if Halifax is convenient for the, the person who is asking the question, uh, we have here um, a genealogical research center. Um, it's sponsored uh, by Scotiabank. It's the Scotiabank Family History Center. Um, but coming into the center and asking our genealogical research staff to help you is free. There is no admission cost. Um, they'll help you go through records, look for traces. Uh, depending where they're coming from, uh, you may be able to look for outbound records as well as entry records for the Canadian side. Generally for the period of Pier 2 uh, arriving here in Halifax, incoming records are, are not bad. Um, you have pretty good odds of, of tracking something down. Um, the more information you can round up on the people before you get in touch with our gene genealogical research staff, the better. Um, often, Again, depending where they're from, there are considerations like name changes. Um, immigration records actually usually tend to be closer to the spelling they might know from, from the old world, if you will. Um, so, you know, instead of Walter, you have Ladislav uh, in the immigration return and so on. Anglicization usually happens later. Um, as I say, people are, when they arrive, it's not they're sitting down and doing this paperwork new. Right. Um, this paperwork is usually completed by ship's crew, who are usually European, maybe from the same countries as the people, based on their passports and their other documentation. So older spellings um, of their names would be very helpful. Um, stuff about their ages, places and dates of birth, if you have it, great. Um, and anything you know about where they were from or where they were going, those are the kinds of things that you can usually pick up in, a, in an immigration return pretty quickly to help you make sure, you know, this is the record we found is the person we're, we're looking for. 
Um, but again, you know, if, if Halifax is handy, uh, any day that we're open to the public, you can come right down and, and go into the center without paying admission. If not, um, you know, if that's inconvenient, uh, you can always send inquiries, you know, to us by email, info at peer21.ca, and that'll get screened to whatever researcher is the right person, um, you know, uh, including genealogical inquiries and so on. And we have staff who are happy to help. So, you know, by all means, <laughs> hit us up. We'd love to help you with that kind of question. That's fabulous. And it's fabulous service. We have a comment from a participant who says that was such an interesting talk and so well presented. Thank you. Thank you. I flew into Vancouver via Calgary in 1967 in the surge of teachers at all levels, me post-secondary and my husband, then for university. I miss the experience of Pier 21. And I'm assuming, Stephen, that that will be a, a common missing out for many people. Well, so we're in a gallery right now that focuses on the history of Pier 21, but we could go for a walk across the way and we have the Canadian Immigration Hall where we cover the broader story of immigration to the country. Um, you know, we are a, a national museum. We engage with stories for people coming, yes, here, but also by way of the land boundary, certainly by way of the West Coast and by air, um, you know, <laughs> I think maybe one or two actually by foot as well as by car and so on. Um, so, I, you know, dear person asking question, you have my attention. <laughs> I would love to know more about this story. Um, you know, uh, and again, um, you know, on our website, there's a, a page peer21.ca slash share. Uh, and you can go there and begin the process if you're interested of sharing the story of your experience of coming to the country. This museum, mm -hmm. we're talking about Pier 21 today because we have, we're, we're the only national museum that's in a historic site that's on mission, right? But we have this wonderful opportunity and grace of, of being in a historic immigration site, but that's not at all all we do. Uh, and so the, a story like that, you know, coming by air to another place, it's still in our wheelhouse and we'd love to learn. We'd love to learn more about it. Well, we have a question for you now that's really going to test your knowledge, Stephen. Here you go. Uh -oh. I know here we're ready. Would Leon Trotsky have passed through Pier 21 on his way to brief imprisonment in what is now the Armdale Yacht Club? I yeah, mean, probably, probably not because of the period. Okay. Um, military transit, uh, there were some cargo ships and there were limited numbers of passenger liners that called at the infrastructure that became Pier 21 later um, during the First World War, but generally no. Um, Pier 2 uh, was the principal embarkation point for Canadian military during the Second World War, and that includes military tasks like the transit of prisoners. Um, I don't know Trotsky's file offhand. I'd be curious to go looking. Um, but I would be comfortable making a reasonable wager that you'd be looking a little further north in the city for, for transit. Now, interestingly, um, although Trotsky wouldn't have gone through here, some of his cohort as prisoners at Amherst did come here to help build the site as interned labor in the summers of 1915 and 1916. So, for me, as an immigration historian, you know, one of the main groups that came here in the busiest years that the site was running after the Second World War, it was German immigrants. How different our conception of the site is when we remember that German prisoners participated in the laying of the foundations of it. Thank you. We have a question um, about someone's grandparents. Yeah. Okay. My grandparents came through St. John. Sure. He had been, my, my little cue is moving on me here. So I'm going to try and locate it now. Here, I'm going to start over. My grandparents came through St. John. Um, grandfather had been hired by the Grand Trunk Railroad. Did many come this route? 
her other yeah. grandparents came to Montreal. Yeah, no. Um, so on Canada's East Coast, you have, uh, we would readily identify four major ports, right? St. John, Halifax, Quebec, and Montreal. And St. John and Halifax were winter ports in the main early on uh, with when the ice was off the St. Lawrence, it was preferable if you could to get as far inland on the boat uh, before changing to rail. It was um, both more economical, but also, again, we don't necessarily think of it right away, but depending on the relationship between your carriers, did your shipping company do business with Canadian National Railways or with Canadian Pacific, they might prefer one port or the other. St. John was a CP port, Halifax was CN. Um, the other thing to keep in mind though too, and again, we don't think of it so much, but if you get a little, a little earlier for late 1800s, early into the early 19s, but not much, Portland, Maine was actually a significant Canadian port of entry too. Um, and this was actually one of the reasons that that development at St. John and at Halifax was pushed pretty hard in the early 20th century. Um, there was a real risk of losing that traffic south of the border uh, where someone could choose to continue on American track or veer north. Uh, and Canada as a state wanted to invest in the infrastructure necessary to keep that traffic as much as possible, whether passengers or cargo, you know, moving through a Canadian port on Canadian rails to a Canadian destination. Um, but St. John and Halifax, there was a certain amount of competition in the region between these ports. Um, and a number of historians have touched on this. Um, uh, nouns are the first to go. Oh dear. Uh, I mean, Jay White, of course, um, but uh, there's a, a couple of other histories involving St. John as a railway port that are right there on the tip of my tongue that I don't have. <laughs> if this person is really interested in sort of the, the local history of St. John, um, my email address uh, or an email you can reach me at easily is research at peer21.ca. Uh, and I'd be really pleased to, to take a quick look and gather up some of the immigration related materials uh, as well as materials related to the railways in the two sites. They're you know, pretty readily available and it, it would maybe because of the family connection of working with one of the major railways, um, you know, maybe it did be enriching context and I would be very pleased to do that. That's very generous, thank you. We have a, a comment. I really enjoyed your presentation, which was quite informative as well as animated and enthusiastic. It was an engaging talk that seamlessly combined a walking tour with insightful commentary. I appreciated getting the historic context for Pier 21, plus the humanized perspective. And I was gonna say that's one of the things that resonated with me and my sense is if we are to come to Pier 21, we will get lots of those human stories. Well, my colleagues and I, um, you know, there's a, a, a real priority here on first person experience uh, as a lens for immigration stories uh, and immigra understanding immigration history. And that's really important. Um, immigration and immigration history to a certain extent, of course, you have sort of the, the machinations of the big bureaucracy and the policies and the orders and council. And I, I mean, nerds like me love those, but how, they, how the rubber hits the road is actually how a person's lived experience of choosing hopefully maybe choosing, sometimes being forced or, or sometimes um, having limited freedom, uh, leaving their country of origin. And then what is their trajectory to Canada and how does Canada accept them? Um, we, we think of sort of big state systems in that, but the people themselves, the immigrants, refugees, migrants, uh, temporary foreign workers who make the decisions along that journey have a lot to teach us um, about you know, how, how the, that power worked. Um, in a lot of cases to this day, 
immigration officials retain a lot of discretion in terms of how they might prioritize a certain interview, in terms of how they view a certain case. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, the sympathy with which a case might be treated or not. Um, there's a, a good book by a guy named Vic Satsowicz. He's a sociologist. It's titled, Who Gets In? That talks about the interaction between sort of the people and the system in a re relatively contemporary way. Um, and it helps us understand that, uh, you know, there's a lot of human agency sort of on both sides of the desk, if you will, in terms of the immigrants choosing to come as well as the agents looking at their admissibility. Um, the other thing though, too, is um, for a site like Pier 21, and this is a site I've had the fortune to study a bit, you know, there's sort of the official correspondence and there's floor plans and all that jazz, fine, it's great. Right, it's good, it's useful. But you learn a lot about the site as a place through the stories that, that people pass through or particularly people who worked here can tell you. So for me, one of the favorite stories is the story from a nurse who lived at the site in one of the apartments. She was here for about 13 years. Her name was Florence mm -hmm. Waldron. Uh, and she was interviewed um, before the museum even opened uh, about the experience of being a nurse here, living here and so on. And you know, for instance, the idea of being a person who would look at you and say, I don't know how many baptisms there were in my living room. <laughs> you know, like imagine that being part of your lived experience, you know, that, that new immigrants to Canada would have their, their children being born just down the hall from your living room and then they would come with the port chaplain and this new Canadian baby would be baptized right there in your space. I mean, you know, that's not in the correspondence, that's not in the memos. Um, and here's this lovely woman telling what it was like to open her curtains and open her door and make these people welcome in her little apartment. You know, oh, that's lovely. So there's, yeah, no, I, I, as much as, and don't get me wrong, I'm a microfilm nerd as much as the next guy. I love these sort of the old files on the history of the site through the immigration branch and everything. But the people's stories bring it to life. And we are a site of lived history. 1928 is as old as it goes. There are many people who have lived memory of that, right? Um, you know, and, and like when we were talking about the war, that story of the, the boy who came down here to play. There are lots of ways to think about the site being in becoming public space again in the city. But the guy caring to tell that story and share it, well, that's real, that's imaginable, that's something that happened. And you know, you could <laughs> you could see his delight talking about wrestling with his friends to get those coins off the pier and go and buy their hamburgers uptown, right? And it, it's um, it is in a disciplinary way, in a, in a methodological way, it's a different kind of history, it's oral history. And we, we have an oral historical unit here. We have a long running oral history program. We approach it with discipline and rigor, but we also approach it with such delight. It's wonderful to work with. Well, here, here's a question for your blueprints, for your blueprints. Yeah, song. Sure, yeah. Okay. There is a complex of buildings either side of the museum. Were they yep. part of the original Pier 21? Oh, um, let's go for a walk. Okay. And we'll go back to the model to answer this, okay? Because that's that's the most effective way to deal with this, I think. Um, because then I can introduce the spaces properly uh, with, with a visual cue. So pardon me while we go through the space again. Um, should I hum hold music? No, you're It'll doing just be that's a fine. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's just waiting to see where we're going now. Back to the well, original. we're just going back to the model, but what this will do is give us a nice concrete reference for what those buildings were, what they did, and so on. So I'm gonna flip this camera around and we're gonna point it down and look at the model. Okay. So pardon me. There we go. Don't you love it when the technology doesn't work? Well, here it is. There we go. Okay, so the question is about the adjoining annex building, first of all, I take it. And the annex building absolutely was part of historical Pier 21. What we see there 
And I don't know how well framed the shot is, but uh, I'll just go around. Um, what we see in this annex building uh, are basically the facilities on the lower level for dealing with stuff and up high at the far end, the social services. So Pier 21, sort of the long waterside building that we see spread out ahead of us here, that waterside building was about people. This adjoining building absolutely was part of the complex. And it's actually, the fact that it's here is part of what made um, Pier 21 acceptable to the immigration department to even move here. They, they didn't want to come to Pier 21. They thought it was a terrible idea to move into a cargo shed. And they actually, did, they described Pier 21 as altogether unsatisfactory and the space will never be suitable for the reception of immigrants or the det detention of passengers. They had a very low opinion of this. But one of the things that changed their mind was exactly what the questioner points to, the complex of buildings. Pier 21 was two buildings. So the annex building, was uh, part of the sale, if you will, of moving down here to the immigration branch and to the customs department who had to work in that space, examining people's uh, uh, large baggage. Now, if we just come around a little bit and we'll look at the, the length of the building, um, for those, <laughs> and this is, I'm sorry, this is a little niche, but for those of you who are still in Halifax, that rump of brick, at the end of Pier 21 is still visible today. Um, there's the big NASCAD facade, sort of the bunker gray long piece that occupies much of this space of historic Pier 21 now, but that little bump at the end is still visible. That's where the hospital was. After that, you have Pier 20, and that was not part of the immigration facility. But when ships were coming in, there were certainly days, there was one day in April of 1930 where six ships came in at once. So while we didn't use the building here as part of the complex, the pier itself on the outside here, ships could tie up here and the passengers could debark to the level of the brow, walk along the pier and be handled by the immigration officers up in Pier 21. The central office bay, which is, kind of the brick facade where you see the main doors, the museum and so on from the other side. Um, that was not really part of the immigration complex. And so its connection to the site is a little looser, um, but you know what was in there? American immigration. From 1890, well, 1894 it was finished, but 1893 on, and really in 1894 it was formalized, um, there was what was colloquially termed the Canada Agreement operating, whereby American officers would come to Canadian ports and process onward passengers for the States. Uh, we also had a team, for example, down at Ellis Island and uh, later at other ports of entry too. It was a kind of a team effort. So while the, the, the buildings on either side of just strictly what is Pier 21, that long waterside shed, while those were not nominally part of the immigration infrastructure, see here we get a long view of that waterside shed, 500 feet of it. The, the shed past it and the little office bay here where the front doors to the museum are today, nominally those are not part of the historical facility, but functionally they, they had a role, right? You had the ports police and you had American immigration in that office bay. And from the other side, tying up on the water side, sure. You know, ships could be all up and down that water side of the key. All right. That's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, no, my pleasure. We have a, a question that says, no doubt immigration paperwork is done in advance today too. But what yeah. is the most popular arrival and settlement destinations? Uh, MTV, Montreal, <laughs> Toronto, Vancouver. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not even close. Um, however, um, you know, there's a number of interesting uh, changes coming in terms of how we approach immigration uh, globally, <laughs> but also within Canada. Um, many people will be aware that, you know, there's sort of 70 plus years of, of well-organized 
uh, international cooperation for, for orderly migration. And this comes out of after the Second World War um, uh, and grows through ICOM to uh, recently the UN's compact on migration and so on. And those are meant to um, uh, provide for sovereign and secure uh, cooperative movement of people between states uh, to reduce irregular migration and so on. Um, but one of the neat things that happening, of course, in the Canadian context, immigration authority in our constitution is, it's shared between the federal government and the provincial government. So now many of us know there's provincial departments of immigration too, right? Uh, this, uh, th as early as sort of the early 1900s, you had Ontario sending representatives over to Europe to invite people to come and settle in Ontario on the strength of their own government's authority, right? 1968, you have Quebec setting up its provincial immigration department with, you know, a clear policy for sort of uh, sustaining um, an independent immigration uh, within the framework of federal requirements, but meeting the province's goals. And this, you know, this resonates in Nova Scotia to this day, where we have nominated immigration within the province. We're looking at plans, for example, uh, I know there's um, provisions for many of the international students who study here, who like it here, you know, they get good credentials, but previously, you know, they might not have a good pathway to stay. Well, that, that's kind of dumb. You know, we get someone who's been resident here for four years doing a degree, improving their English and, and getting good credentials, and then we don't give them pathway to, to stay even though they like it. Hmm. So they're, they're looking at a pathway there, for instance, at the provincial level, but what's neat is now even medium-sized cities like Halifax are beginning to look at the role of municipal governments cooperating in generating um, immigration policy and practice. So a city like ours um, isn't just sort of a passive recipient, we become an agent looking to recruit but also looking to understand like, how do we reduce the service burden? How do, because, you know, immigration, once somebody steps off in Canada, it's not milk and honey. You know, there's, there's language adaptation, there's qualifications. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's coming as a refugee, like there's um, layers of care involved in a responsible immigration system. And for every level of government to be involved is awesome because that's how it works in real life, even if it hasn't been reflected in policy. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I could keep going on that because it's a big topic, but I'm not going to because there's other questions. We may have you back. Carol asks, I was part of an art show in a gallery that was part of Pier 21. What yeah. would that have been originally? Uh, well, again, this is a, this is a fun question uh, and I'm glad it's being asked um, because it, the history of the site after it closed in 1971 is really cool. Um, Let's just, I, I'm gonna have a look at the space again in the model because it's good for dealing with these questions about the place of Pier 21. So, pardon me. Okay, so here we have the place of Pier 21. Hooray! Um, so, it, Pier 21 closed as an immigration facility in 1971, but it, it was used very shortly thereafter for the Nova Scotia Nautical Institute for a number of years. Uh, up to the early 90s, at which point the Nautical Institute was relocated uh, to Port Hawkesbury campus of the Nova Scotia Community College. After that, especially in what had been the immigration quarters, there were artist studios. And uh, a lot of those studios, um, they were offered space relocated to what, what is now called Studio 21, just up um, by the Nova Scotia Power Building, just uh, around the corner from where we are now, really. Um, but no, there were there were practicing artists and fabricators and so on down here. I, you know, as a historian of the site, I have uh, really strong feelings about the destruction of the historical footprint when NASCAD was put in place here. But NASCAD does work with another significant piece of the history of the site, which is the artistic heritage. It was a cultural property for many years, and adding fabricator studios and artists and learning uh, mentorship in the arts to the site is in the spirit of exactly what the question is referring to, that use of this space. And I would expect that would have fallen somewhere between the, like the mid to late nineties, maybe. 
Fabulous. Yep. Sandra's wondering what percentage of immigrants arriving at Pier 21 after World War II or just after World War II would have settled here in Nova Scotia? Very small, less than 5%. Um, there, there were a number of reasons for this, uh, but the, the boom years of immigration uh, through Pier 21 basically encompassed sort of two, perhaps three big movements. Uh, first of all, I talked about the war brides. That's the, the single biggest movement that went through here. And of course the war brides are distributed based on where their, their husbands are from. Uh, and that was all over the country based on population. Um, but the other big movement that really drove uh, traffic through this site was the arrival after the Second World War of displaced persons and refugees. Now, the arrival of displaced persons and refugees, um, again, there are stories we tell ourselves about Canadian immigration that are maybe a little more complicated than we, than we give a nod to necessarily. Uh, again, we tend to think of this post-war acceptance as, as principally humanitarian. And I think that's okay, but it's incomplete. A really important part of accepting post-war refugees and, and displaced persons to Canada was math about their employment. Uh, in the economy of post-war Canada, there was a, a lot of domestic resistance to the idea of bringing in people maybe who's, you know, there was fear about would there be employment for resident Canadians as well as for immigrants coming in. I mean, this connection between employment and immigration, and it, that's been decoupled a lot and debunked a long time ago, but that's that was the thinking. Um, but they were, there was also a, a certain amount of nativism. Uh, almost every major immigration wave to Canada has been accompanied by domestic pushback, uh, wondering what sort of the cultural impact would be and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, you know, there, the immigration department received a letter warning of uh, accepting too many people from Poland after the war because they were Catholics. And if too many Catholics came to Canada, there would be a civil war. Um, which makes us think about current thoughts about religious groups and settlement a little hopefully differently because, you know. Um, in any event, the displaced persons and refugees, what made this movement acceptable uh, was uh, a couple of test movements, largely involving um, veterans of service with free Polish forces through 1946 and 47 arriving, uh, just, uh, more than 4,000 of them coming. And they were coming to labor contracts. Uh, and they were coming, <laughs> they were not admitted as immigrants initially, they were admitted on a contract. And if they finished their contract, they would be eligible to be uh, in immigration terms landed, that is to gain status as a resident in Canada. But they had to get that contract done first. And this was what made this settlement of, of refugees and displaced persons palatable and saleable politically mm -hmm. was that we would accept some thousands of them as a test, see how the contracts went, and they went swimmingly, right? Um, these guys came, they were in good health, they filled their contracts, and this made it possible to sell larger movements where employers would say, fine, we'll bring people in to, you know, work on a mine outside Sudbury or do lumber work in you know, uh, a forest in Quebec or go out to BC and work as farm labor. Uh, and so what you have is sort of bulk labor contracting to bring in these refugees and displaced persons. This is the fine print that we forget about this movement, right? It was a humanitarian movement, right? We were accepting people who were in dire circumstances who needed a safe refuge and we gave that to them. But there was a hook and the hook was they had to take a contract to come. Uh, but the nature of that co those contracts was that most of the work was central or Western Canada. And so a huge proportion of the people who came through here, uh, what they saw of Halifax was the rail cut and the Bedford Basin and then they were gone, you know, off the gas bay and down to Montreal, changed trains and, you know, three or four days later they're arriving God bless them in the middle of nowhere to pull sugar beets, you know, <laughs> and, and that was the nature of the movement. Well, here's a question based in Amherst. 
Sure. You mentioned the internment POW camp during World War I in Amherst. Is yep. there a published history of this? Oh, um, I mean, there's certainly like, well, I mean, there's the official histories through uh, the Department of Defense. Um, there are a number of histories. There's novels written by historians. There's historical fiction. Um, there are journal articles. There's, there's all like, there's a lot. Um, a lot of the primary sources related to the internment camps are now available online. Uh, if the person is really interested in the history of the Amherst site, uh, again, my email address is research at year21.ca. Drop me a line, I'll, I'll pull together like three or four of the key sources, it'd be my pleasure. Um, you know, there's interesting reading and uh, a lot of the resources have been public long enough now that there's some really good secondary, um, you know, good books written on it, so. Sure. Fabulous. Yep. We have a comment from Annie who says very well presented, but she wanted you to know that she watched it through her mother's eyes who came through Pier 21 in 1946 as a war bride from Belgium, six oh, weeks pregnant with guess who? Annie. Oh. So she uh, she did actually enter the site as a sort of a passenger, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Annie, what a fabulous story. Of course, given my family sympathies, you know, with my grandmother, my aunt coming here, um, you know, that that story certainly speaks to my heart. Um, you know, I, again, we do collect the stories. Uh, we're interested in the stories of people with connection to the site. Uh, and I'd love to learn from you. Um, I, I would say in addition, uh, although the mandate of the site has broadened, um, you know, in our recent book project about the site, in our gallery here, in our oral history and in our collection, you know, the history of, of the war brides and the, the dependents uh, as the biggest wave that came through here uh, is still one we cherish, um, you know, and I, I'm really pleased to, uh, that you chose to share the connection. Um, you know, it's, it's one that's, uh, near and dear to my heart. Thank you. I think I have two more questions. I have three more questions for you. Um, sure. Ian is thanking you for a great presentation and wonders how much of a lived history can you understand and express compared to how much you can present? And that may be a, a difference between what you were talking about, the documentation versus the oral mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that's a, a complex question with all kinds of answers. Uh, I'll take it as a question about sort of oral history and talking to someone and then using it in the museum. Um, and the answer is, uh, I'm going to waffle and say it depends, but then I'm going to answer a little more. Um, generally, the approach we take with oral history is a little bit of a life history approach where we invite people to, to really share something of a short biography with us, usually over the course of a couple of hours. Um, we do have a framework of questions that sort of uh, concentrates on the immigration experience where it's an immigrant, um, but we, we're also interested in, you know, <laughs> the, the person's lived context that makes that migration journey meaningful. Uh, and so we'll explore that with them too. Getting that into the museum happens in a few ways. Uh, so sometimes uh, an uh, a, a quote from an immigrant can just be uh, like from an oral history, could simply be maybe drawn out for one particular little element of the exhibit. You know, I remember the big pier when we arrived and I remember I had never seen anything so big in all my life, right? So it's just a little quote but there it serves to illustrate something about that first experience. Or again, maybe we have a person's oral history, right, with a quote, but we also have some pictures from them, right? Or here, now this is fun. Now, I don't know how much of that you could hear, but that was Jack and Ellie Shooten, and Jack's talking about a family they knew on the ship not having a good journey. Um, you may remember I talked about a couple on the train holding hands and the gentleman wondering, you know, is this, is this for us? 
that's Jack. Um, and in this case, uh, his, his voice is actually right here in the exhibit. Um, there are other ways that we integrate oral histories. Um, you know, here we, we have everything from the short print quote to that, you know, hearing the voice with the ship presentation, but also, you know, we'll, we'll do something. Stephen, I'm not hearing you. I'm not sure if others are having the same issue. There we go. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, we have oral history stations where we display, you know, several uh, clips of maybe 90 seconds or so. Um, so you get sort of a range of responses from, you know, like the short quotes on the wall to a longer sound loop to these. And then in the other gallery of the museum, the Canadian Immigration Story Gallery, we have clips you know, three to five minutes long, you can sit down. And at that length, you have a little more time to hear the context of somebody's story. Uh, and then of course, as the museum, the oral histories are generally public. So if somebody really wants to make use of the, the interview, they can access usually the whole thing, unless somebody has put a privacy restriction on it or something, uh, both the transcript and the audio and video. So, In terms of making use of the oral history, um, <laughs> there's all kinds of opportunities. We've even used them to fuel things like uh, collaborative theater productions with partners and so on. Um, but there's also always the ethics. You know, um, somebody who participates and shares their story, uh, it's a profound learning opportunity, but it is also intimate. And so there's always the dignity of the participant to consider when we think about sort of how we're going to display that in the museum. Sorry about the technical glitch there. Not um, a problem. But I, I hope that deals with the question. Uh, Ian, if you have more detailed questions or you're curious about, you know, sort of our practice and our approach to storytelling with the oral history, um, there's a certain amount of information on the website, including uh, in the online collection area, a fair number of good clips from the oral history collection. But also, you know, do feel free to correspond with me. And again, research at year21.ca. I'm here to take questions and uh, I love questions, especially about that. Oral history is uh, one of the most special sort of methods and opportunities of the history we do at this site. We have a few questions left for you. Um, That's good. Carol is wondering if NESCAD and the Mary Black Gallery are in what was originally the annex building. No. No, they're in what was Shed 21. Uh, the Mary Black is on the ground floor uh, in what would have been cargo handling space. Uh, NASCAD includes part of the historic footprint of the National Historic Site Pier 21 and is indeed, you know, right in what we would think of as the historic immigration quarters. So when we look at this view of Pier 21, you see sort of the further part away from us, the walls are kind of a, a warmer beige. <laughs> I don't know how to, kind of a more buttery beige, if I can say that, sorry. Um, NASCAD has basically overwritten all of that space of uh, historic Shed 21. 
The Mary Black, by contrast, is kind of on the ground floor where we see those um, kind of garage doors for, uh, for handling cargo. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. John says, there must have been pulses of immigration driven by religious persecution in homelands. Some found sanctuary in Canada. Can you comment? Yeah, now that's a very good question. For Pier 21, um, religious persecution is a little bit less of a factor just because of the narrow window of time that it operated. Uh, 1928 to 1971 with those boom years right in the 50s. When we think of persecution driving movement here, it's mostly persecution related to the war. There you have, of course, Holocaust survivors. You have um, people who were deemed um, like prisoners of conscience of the Nazi regime. There were lots of Christian preachers who were in the camps and so on too. Um, and then you have people like Mennonites uh, who endured a new displacement from territories occupied by the Soviet Union. Um, but when I think of religious persecution movement to Canada, I usually go a little bit earlier or a little bit later. Um, and in the earlier movements, uh, I'm thinking of people like Mennonites and Dukovors uh, coming in the late 18s with really structured agreements with the federal government leading to communal settlements out west. Um, and a little bit later when Canada really gets on the ball after the 60s with uh, signing on to the refugee convention. Uh, and then you start seeing um, certain movements based on uh, the terms outlined in the convention, including particular social groups, which includes creed and religion. Stephen, our timing is almost perfect. We, we're hoping to get everyone out by four and we only have one question left. There you go. Uh, well, I mean, this is what that, happens when you have an expert moderator, right? <laughs> My favorite person. Colleen says, was this contract idea also responsible for the large number of Polish, Italian, and Ukrainian settlers to the mining areas of Cape Breton? And what years would that idea have been most popular? Oh, what a great question. Uh, movement to Cape Breton uh, and sort of taking up an industrial Cape Breton is a little bit earlier than I was talking about sort of the post-Second World War um, like making the displaced persons and refugees uh, uh, politically possible as a movement uh, with those contracts. But absolutely, yes, employment, industrial employment demand was a factor in driving, you know, the incredible diversity that you find in, you know, uh, like Whitney Pier, for example. At, at one point, I, I doubt there'd be a more multicultural place in Canada. Right, uh, you'd have people coming up from the Caribbean, you'd have Eastern European settlers, you mentioned Italian sojourners coming for uh, way journeying, uh, typically with mines or steelwork, and then back home again. Um, yes, uh, a little different structure, but absolutely the concept of industrial settlement and labor priority in the work. Yeah, absolutely. And that actually, um, <laughs> we, we have up here an artifact I love, uh, which is uh, based on, I think, my idea, the most honest name of the department in the 20th century, uh, manpower and immigration with all of the gendering and labor connotations that are, are, are evident there. Um, but when we think about the priority of people for work, uh, I love that title of the department. And I think it speaks directly to the kind of experiences that we're, we're thinking about with that question, right? People coming expressly because yeah, I can work for a season in the mine and then go home. Or I'm an experienced miner, I can immigrate and the employer wants me to take up as a long-term resident. Stephen, thank you. That, that was, was our last question. question. This has been fabulous. We have learned so much in the most wonderful possible way. Um, you've engaged us and intrigued us and um, we'll all be going off to see Pier 21 and learn a little more, I'm sure. Well, I, I'd love to extend an invitation to the site, of course, for people. Um, but also I mentioned we have a number of temporary exhibits that are might be germane 
Um, in the short run, there's the Canada and Germany, which is closing quite soon uh, exhibit, which for a number of us with German roots locally, that might speak to us. Uh, but then shortly we have opening two exhibits on internment. Um, there's an exhibit, Broken Promises on Japanese Canadian internment paired with Enemy Alien, uh, the Ukrainian internment experience. And those exhibits will be with us from um, early February until late April, I think. And then from May until July, we have um, uh, uh, an art and history exhibit called In My Yesterday, dealing with the Chinese Canadian community in the Maritimes, as well as um, uh, Revealing Chignecto, a Parks Canada exhibit dealing with the, the human history of uh, in place of the, uh, the isthmus. So there's a couple of exhibits coming down here that really have some, some local entanglement. Uh, and I'd love for, for people to come down and explore. If you do come down, uh, you know, uh, by all means, I'd encourage you to explore the Pier 21 gallery, which we've seen a little bit of today, but make your way to the other gallery too, <laughs> that tells the broader story of immigration to Canada. Um, you know, and it'll help put this in, in broader context. You convinced us. Well, do come. We, we love having lots of visitors. <laughs> And as we wrap up, I just want to, to thank our IT team who is at work during the presentation, but also long before the presentation, ensuring that, that we have everything that we need. So Bill Lee and Bob Russell, thank you as always. We would like to um, thank participants as well, because we know you give up an afternoon to come and be informed and engaged, but it is still an afternoon. And we would encourage you to, if you aren't already, to consider a SCANS membership. Um, there are courses currently getting started. They are on our website, thescans.org. And we would um, nudge you gently to go and have a look. You will be sure to find something that's going to, like our presentation this afternoon, um, inform you um, and um, draw you in. We will, over the course of the next day or so, be sending out an evaluation, and I know those things are a pain in the butt, but we find them very helpful. Um, how did we do this time, but also what might you like to see yeah. in the future? And we do have two um, public lectures coming up, one in Lunenburg, um, a two-parter on the 1st and 15th of February, which you might be interested in, Stephen, War Fighter to Fighting for Poverty. And one on January 30th via Zoom, um, poverty is a political issue. And that will be a panel discussion. And you can register for those online at thescans.org. And at this point, we will say goodbye. And once again, thanks, Stephen, for a fabulous afternoon. Thank um, you, everyone. It's a pleasure. It's my privilege. Thank you. <laughs>